Good morning, church. I have one big announcement for you, and it's right here. It is that our, we're going to try an English service on October the 4th. So if you're interested in it, we're going to be on campus at 9.30, and you need to register on September 27th. It's limited to 50 people, so if you want to be, uh, well, it's a first come, first serve, so you want to be uh, right there when it starts. Okay, so we look forward to reopening our church or re-entering our church on October the 4th. this morning if you have your bibles turn over to first peter chapter four we're in a series called living with hope in a broken world and our and our world it needs hope and so we've been talking about this in the last month or so and this morning we're going to talk about uh, rejoicing in hope you know if you look at our world actually in in the peter's world when he uh, when he wrote this letter they needed some hope in the midst of suffering and so he's writing to them to this time around, saying that they actually can rejoice in hope. They're already secure in hope. They have their hope in the, in the resurrected, live, living, risen Lord. And he's he rose again, so we can be sure that we're going to be raised again too. And, and Peter wants them to know that even in the midst of persecution and suffering, hope is on the way. So... Peter reminds them that they're only temporary residents on this earth and they need to look for Christ who is their example of being able to be rejoice in persecution and suffering. And that is by separating themselves and practicing and doing the things of God. Even though people are, you know, persecuting them or slandering them, one day God will take care of it. And so we need, so they needed hope. In their suffering and sometimes we might feel like that way too that we're in a situation that uh, right now that we feel like we need some hope and we actually do 
but how can we rejoice in suffering? So we're going to take a look at this in chapter 4 and how to rejoice in suffering. First of all, uh, I'm going to give you three points. It's going to, how you can rejoice in suffering is by thinking and living like Jesus because that brings you victory and that brings us some joy. Say, so, hey, we're actually living beyond this broken world. The second thing is we want to uh, rearrange our priorities. In other words, we want to, want to do the things that are going to last for eternity. And if you know that you're doing something it's going to last, that should bring you joy as well. The third thing is we want to do good to make God look good. When we, in the midst of suffering and we're doing good things, um, it brings glory to God. And so I can rejoice in that. Actually. Even though things are happening with me, uh, I can rejoice because I know God is, make, is looking good. His reputation is look good because of the things that I'm doing. So let's take a look at the first point here. How to rejoice in hope is to basically think and live like Jesus. So here it says there, therefore, since Christ, and again, the red letters are those are those um, words that are emphasized in the Greek. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, you know that he went through uh, the crucifixion. He went through a lot of you know suffering himself. He says, he says, since Christ suffered in his body, he says, now you arm yourselves. In other words, prepare yourselves with what? The same attitude. In other words, arm yourselves to think like Jesus does. Prepare yourself to think like Jesus does. Because whoever suffers in this body is done with sin. In other words, if you've been, been persecuted and you still um, do the right thing, and you don't sin because sometimes when you are persecuted, you want to be you, you're uh, tempted to do the wrong thing or to compromise. He says, if, but if you think of it the same way that Jesus did, and he suffered in his body, yet he did the he did the right things, right? He was he was um, unjustly uh, suffering, and he but he was still obedient. He still did the right things, and you know that because of what he did, there was actually a victory that came from it. That is our salvation. And he says, uh, so says, he says, so think like Jesus. And then in verse two, it says, as a result, they do not live, uh, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil des human desires, but rather for the will of God. So the, there, Jesus lived like, lived for, for God's will. So to, so to rejoice in hope, we want to think and we want to live like Jesus because there's victory that comes from, so we'll see that in a little bit. So he says here, he says here, uh, think like Jesus, have the same attitude, because if you suffer, guess what, in the body, in other words, you suffer with persecution or what people are trying to do with you, and you don't do the wrong thing, you do the right thing, guess what? You have victory over sin. That's something to rejoice about. And even though um, the people would tell you something different, you didn't give in. You, you still live for God. You live for the will of God and not for your own pleasures. You Basically, you overcome the power of sin and, you, and you, your old life is gone. And you focus on the will of God instead because you're living for something that's way bigger than what's on in this broken world. And so now what happens is that you can, uh, you can now live victorious. You don't have to sin. Because you're thinking and you're living like Jesus. In fact, um, you look at this, how can there be joy? I mean, did Jesus have joy in, um, in suffering in the body? L let me show you. In Hebrews, it says this, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him. What's the joy? See, the joy he endured, the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, how can there be joy in that? Because Jesus understood that if he lives for God, that there's a victory in it. Again, I already said, what was the victory? It was the salvation of people, that the salvation that's available for people. And so even though we may not, we may not see it right away in the suffering that we, we may go through, we want to think like Jesus did. Jesus understands that the Father has a plan, that he can take these things and make something really great out of them. And so our suffering is, is very similar. That 
there's victory that comes out of it. So in this case, instead of compromising during persecution, we live for God. We think like Jesus and understand there's there's a joy that comes because there's victory that comes out of living for God, living for God's will. Now, let me show you here. So what happens here in verse uh, three is, guess what? You don't have to do this anymore. Do what? Look what it says in verse three. You have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Pagans just basically are the unbelievers there. Um, they're living in debauchery and lust and drunkenness and orgies and carousing and detestable island. You don't, you don't have to do that anymore. If you think and live like Jesus in the midst of persecution, you're going to have victory, which is you don't have, you're, you've broken the power of sin. You don't have to live this way anymore because living the power of under the power of sin, that leads to death. But if you live for the, for the will of God, it leads to life and you can rejoice in that. And you don't, you don't know what else what God will do. Now here comes the, um, oh, by the way, in those days, they would have these parties and they would last all night long and they would be just get drunk and they would just do things that are just, they're just not right. And you know what, you know what um, Peter is saying here? That you can rejoice when you suffer because instead of doing the wrong things, you can do the right things. And, and then look, in um, verse 4, here comes the persecution. They're surprised that, that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. That's where the, that's where the persecution comes from. Um, but here's, here's the beautiful thing in verse 5. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. In other words, everyone. God is ready He's going to help. He says, you know, uh, when he, they have to give an account to him, that means that they're going to, there's a payback that's coming. Nobody escapes God's judgment. And when that time comes, um, it's not going to look good for them. But for you, it'll be better. Now look at what it says here in verse 6. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. In other words, the, now there's different interpretations of this. I think the best one is that the, those who are dead are those believers who had heard the gospel, but now they're, they're now they died. And it says, so they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body. In other words, people are looking at them, they're abusing them, they're slandering them, because, oh, you don't follow the ways that we used to do, you, you don't do these things anymore. But you know what happens? But God says this, and here's the victory. But, they live according to God in regard to the spirit. So even though people look at them and say, see, you didn't, you don't, you don't do the things that we do anymore, and, and you guys are just big, just good goody two-shoe people, and you just think you're better than us. No, it's not that. We're just living for God. And when we do that, we're gonna know that guess what? One, we've already broken the power of sin, and then uh, because of God, and also that we're gonna be uh victorious and that we're going to be living with God. You know, our, our future is secure. It's pretty neat. So that's the first. You want to rejoice in hope in a, in a time of suffering? Then think and live like Jesus because there's victory that comes from it. I can rejoice in that. A second thing we can learn is that we want to, to rejoice in hope is to rearrange our priorities. Go for the things that are eternal, man. Don't go for the things that are just temporary right here. Um, and so when you do that, when you do the things that are the most important things, the priority things, then you're making a difference. And that's, that's where you can rejoice in. You're making a difference for God because you rearrange your priority. And it is so important because we only have so much time on this earth. And that's what Peter says. Look at here in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is near. That's why it's so important. Uh, we're not going to live here forever. There's going to be a time that we're, we're going to this. Our earthly existence is is gone. And he says, "Do it while you can. Rearrange your priorities." And he says, "Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may 
pray. So you pray and ask God, what are the most important things I should do? Now, by the way, when it says the things of all, end of all things, it does not mean, I don't, do not believe that it means the end of the world. I think that, that translation is not correct um, because it didn't say that. It just says the end of all things. And actually the, the Greek word is the idea of a goal. So uh, there's, a, there's an ultimate goal that's, that's unfolding, okay? So he's saying that, he's saying, Peter's saying to his audience that you are living in the last stage of God's redemptive, redemptive program, his plan. And that goal is being unfolded and you're a part of it right now. And so right now, rearrange your priorities. Get things that you know are important, things that are going to last for, for a lifetime into eternity, Focus on these kind of kinds of things. And you know, when you do those things, you know, hey, the things I'm going to do is going to last. Doesn't that bring joy to you? Like, yeah, I didn't just waste my time. I didn't spend all my energies on something that's not going to last. I'm spending things that's going to last. That's going to make a difference. That I want to make every day count. Now, what are those things? He tells us right here in the next verse. He says in verse 8, Above all, love each other deeply. Now, you already know the greatest commandment is to love God. The second is to love others. People are eternal. It didn't say, above all, love my job. It didn't say, above all, get as much as you can. It didn't say, store up as much wealth as you can on this earth. No, he says, above all, make your priorities, rearrange them so that people are at the top. Because they're going to last for eternity. You invest time in people, and then you, you think back on it, and later on, you're going to say, I'm so glad that I did. And it brings joy, because you're doing something that's going to last. So, you want to, you want to um, if you want to have joy in, in the things that are happening around you, in this hope that we have, then love people. Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude multitude of sins, and um, this is so important. You know, we look. We it, it doesn't matter what church it is. I mean, it's happening in, the, in their church. You I mean think about this: if you're under pressure, under persecution, what happens? Uh, oftentimes, so natural is that we start to grumble about each other, we complain about each other, we criticize we criticize each other because we're getting pressure from the outside. But Peter says, don't do that. Because that doesn't help. I mean, that's not a that that's not something that you want to take into eternity. You want what you want to do is you want to love each other, and cover a multitudes of sins. That means that you want to, you know, have more love than criticize. You want to have more love than complain, and you want to have more love in investing in people, rather than tearing them down. Now there are times that we need to confront people for their sin. But overall, he's saying, if you want to really um, be happy and rejoice in the in the future, then rearrange our priorities. Love God and love other people. In fact, how do you love people? Well, he says this in verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. You see? In those times, you know, it, was, it wasn't that, that easy. But we got to offer hospitality. Open up your home, you know, help people uh, without grumbling. Because you know what's going to happen? You're making an investment for eternity. And when you get to eternity, whatever that is, you can look back and go, man, I'm so glad I did that. Because all the other stuff is going to burn. All the stuff is not going to last. But what you invest in loving other people is going to last. In fact, it's keep going. In verse 10, it says, each... Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone who serves, they should do with the strength God provides them. It's not in our strength. So in all that, all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So you know one of the things that, that's so important? We have to get to the point to understand what matters most is our relationship with God and others and, and others.
and you and how you do that how are you gonna how are you gonna um, invest in other people for eternity by serving them by using the whole by using the gift of the Holy Spirit to serve and to speak to each other to help each other now it says there if anyone speaks in verse I mean um, in verse 10 each of you should use whatever gift you have received that is the we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit gives us ministry things to do these are expressions of ministry and he and Peter basically says there are, for him there's two serving and speaking so you do those things and you do it in the power of the Spirit look at verse 11 again if anyone speaks, they should do one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone who serves, they should do this with the strength that God provides. We don't do it our own strength. But, you know, when we are strengthening each other and helping each other out, we are, again, we're investing in the eternal. So often we get so distracted by things in life and we forget about people. And that should not be the case. And uh, here's, the, here's the thing about this. When you serve and you're helping, and you, when I say speak for God, it doesn't mean that you're telling people that this is what God said. He says that, that you're, a, you're ministering to people out of the wisdom that God gives to you to share with them, right? Does the Holy Spirit bring this to mind? Now, why is this, why is this such a big deal? I mean, why is this, how does this bring joy to, to, to us right now and, and the future? How does it do that? Well, the, the reason that brings joy is because, now here's a secret. Well, it's not really a secret, but the thing is, you were made to serve. So if you're doing the things that God asked you to do, my gosh, it, that, it's got to bring joy. Now, some people might say, well, I do a lot of things for God, and you know, I, I don't feel like it's doing anything. But here, let me show you a verse. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, you are created to do, do, good, do good things, to serve other people. And when you serve them, guess what? God sees it all. Even though people don't see it, even though you may not be recognized for it, but God sees it. And he, he never misses out when you're serving for him. And you know, that, that should bring me joy. Even though, you know, things are, again, tough for them, they're being persecuted and suffering, they still have the hope that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's God there and he's seeing everything that I do and it just it, it has to bring me joy. Because you know, whatever you do for God, you know it's going to last. Okay, so uh, if you want to rejoice in hope, then you want to think and live like Jesus because it's going to bring victory in the present and in the future. And also, we got to reprioritize. We got to rearrange our priorities and do the things that are going to last, because that also brings us joy. And when we do those things, that's what God made us to do. So it brings us that joy in in hope. The third thing is to do good to make God look good. And this one here is that again, it's during persecution. How is it that we can rejoice in hope? Because and, and here, here it is. By doing the good things that God asks us to do, it makes God look good. Now, that's my, my uh, way of putting it, phrasing it. Now, why is that? Why does that bring joy? Because we're glorifying God. We're making God look good through the things that we do. And that's what I want to do, don't you? I want to make God look good. I want his reputation to be great. And so when we, when we do good things and we glorify God, Oh, man, that just brings me joy. You know, just like, you know, having a, a birthday party for somebody. We want to do this thing to bring joy to somebody. Now, look at verse uh, 12. It says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has been coming on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But, and here's the word, rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the servants of, of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. You see, when we do good to make God look good, we glorify God. And that should be something that we are so happy about and we rejoice, even though we're being persecuted for Christians. Now in verse 12, it says, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Uh, that could be a figurative, um, you know, that persecution is really tough. 
or it could mean actually it was happening with them in that time. So either it's before or after this writing that um, Emperor Nero was burning the Christians alive. So just think about that. Um, that he, he may be speaking of that. But he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the or or fiery ordeal that has come upon to test you. As so something strange were happening to you. you got to realize that the world is hostile to Christianity. Um, the world that's, that memory says, hey, how come you don't do these things anymore with us? How come you don't participate in all these things? Because the world has different values. As Christians, we don't live for those values. And so we're going to be persecuted. And it's happening even today because we don't share the same values with the world. So the world begins to persecute Christians. Um, but he says in, in 13, Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so you, you may be overjoyed when the glory is revealed. Again, so as we do the things that God asks us to do, he becomes glorified. Because they're going to look at this and why do these people do these things? Even though... I mean, we, we, we smack them down, we, we criticize them. Um, now, it's important now that when we're talking about doing good, we do it as Christians. Now, if, you don't, if you do the wrong things, then there's no glory in it. So that's why in um, 14, it says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you see, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. In other words, when you're insulted, when you're being persecuted, when you're suffering for God, right, as a Christian, um, then God's presence and his power rests on you. Isn't that cool? So he, and then he, on verse 15 says, If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal, even a meddler. You don't want to do that. Uh, a meddler is someone who's a busybody, always interfering and treating other people's business. He says, you don't, you don't suffer for that. If you're suffering for that, hey, that that's not doesn't glorify God. But if you're suffering as a Christian, and, by, and that word in verse 16, uh, Christian is only used three times in the Bible. Initially, it was used as a derogatory, derogatory term, but it really means a follower of Christ. But if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But praise God that you bear his name. See, we're making God look good, even though um, we're suffering. In verse 17, um, for the, it is time for the judgment to begin with the house, God's household. And if, anyone be, if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So, hey, look, yes, we're suffering as a Christian, but, you, but he says it's an honor to do that. Um, it's an honor to do that because we're doing it under the, with the name of God. Sometimes in this time, you know, in the pandemic, it seems a little tough. Um, I don't know how much we're suffering, but it may, may it's a different kind of suffering. But still, we want to do good. We want to do good to people around us so God's name is glorified. They ask us, why do you do these things? And we can tell them because of Jesus Christ and, and he loves you. And, and it, why is that? Because we have a hope. We have a hope that we know if we're real that, that this, this future hope is going to come. And so we don't mind doing it, right? We don't mind uh, the things that are inconvenience of us. But also that, I think he makes it for sure, you know, you know, you know but that sometimes you'll say like, well, what about these other people, you know? And, God said, and Peter says, don't worry about that. God will take care of them. Uh, but right now, he says, in the household of God, that there's judgment, in verse 17, uh, but what a, it says, but what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So we're all going to be judged, but those who are being judged who belong to the household of God, it's going to be judged on what things you do for God. But those who don't know God, I mean, if it, he, and he says it's a hard thing. So look in verse 18, if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? In other words, he's saying, and this, by the way, that's a, that's a quote uh, from um, Proverbs eleven thirty one. He says, if it's hard for the righteous to be saved. Now, how is it hard to be righteous to be saved? Because they're going to persecution. They're suffering. I mean, it's, a, it's not an easy thing. But again, the world is against Christians. But at that, it's a hard thing to be saved in that sense. If that's the case, the what will become of the ungodly and the sinner. My goodness. 
if God's going to judge his own house first, and he loves these people and because they're, they're his family, what about those who are not part of his family? So then in verse 19, he says this, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. You see, that's, that, there it is. We continue to do good. We make God look good. And then he's, ultimately he's glorified. But if you're suffering, sometimes the suffering, it says here, is from God's will. Look what it says, verse 19. Those who surf, surf, suffer according to God's will, you commit yourselves to the, to, the, to the Creator, to God. You let God take care of it. But in the meantime, you continue to do good because it makes God look good. And ultimately, what happens is that you glorify God. And when my God is glorified, oh man, I'm happy. When I know that Jesus Christ is lifted up and exalted, doesn't that have joy for you? Even though I may be suffering. Now, God may have his, his uh, purpose for my suffering to build my character, shape my character, or make me better or whatever it is, or to love, love better, or to stop grumbling, all those different things. But whatever it is, whatever it is he's doing it for a purpose. And then our, our responsibility is to continue to do good. That's what he says at the end of the verse, right? Continue to do good. Because when you do good, you make God look good. And ultimately, he's glorified. So how do you rejoice in hope that we the hope that we have? We have this future hope that's coming. We All we have to do is we think and live like Jesus because he is our hope. And when we do that, um, we can rejoice because we're going to have victory in this life. We're going to have victory in the future. And then we want to rearrange our priorities. We're going to have joy. Then rearrange your priorities. Go for the things that are going to last forever. Don't, don't do the things that are, are just temporary. Don't put all your energies in that. Because again, one day you're going to look back and say, man, I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I love God and I loved other people. Yes, I need to do other things too. But you know, I'm at my priority. I love God. I, I worship God. And then I help and I serve other people by speaking to them or serving them. And then thirdly, I get a lot of joy when I make God look good by the things I do. As a Christian, not as, I mean, not doing evil things and saying, oh, I'm suffering for that. No, it's doing the good things and people are persecuting or abusing or slandering us. It makes God look good. And so that's something that I can rejoice in. So there are going to come periods of suffering in our lives. There's no doubt. And but our experience will be something like Jesus. Jesus experienced all those things, and yet he still did the things that God wanted to do. But you know, one of the things that's so, so great is that we have the knowledge that God's with us when we suffer. And so the trials themselves help us to know God better, to shape our lives, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. So, I don't know about you, um, the world seems like it's going to get worse, but um, we can rejoice because we have hope. And how we can do it by not just hoping and wishing it's going to happen, but living like Jesus does, rearranging our priorities, and doing good to make God look good. So let me ask you here um, today, do you have joy in your circumstances right now? Do you have joy? I want you to remember that you can because we have hope in Jesus Christ. And if we live the way he wants us to live, you can trust him. Our hope is coming. Brothers and sisters, our hope is on the way. It's here and in the future. It's coming. So don't give up. You can rejoice in hope just like Jesus did. He, and he had the joy when he endured the cross because he knew there was something better at the end. Not because of God. Only God can do that. So, guess what? You can trust in Jesus. And if you do that, you're going to have the hope. All right, let's pray. Maybe you don't know God this morning, um, but you realize that joy is something that doesn't come from you, but from the outside of you. It comes from trusting in Jesus, the hope that he gives the Savior of the world. If you give your life to Him, 
You can exchange the depression and the dis disillusionment for joy. Just give your life to him. Just say, Lord, I'm tired of living a depressed life or a, a defeated life, and I want victory. I want Jesus to be my Lord and my master so he can take control. And then I can experience joy in the hope of knowing that he is the, he is the best. There's nothing better than him. Forgive me of my sin, and I'm going to follow him the best way that I can. And maybe you're a, a believer and you understand that difficult times are going to come. Um, but you also realize that this world is passing away. So if you haven't been experiencing joy, you can go back and anchor your life in Jesus Christ, in the hope of our salvation. Live for God, live for God, and live for others. Serve them, because we only have so much time left. Um, God's God's um, program is, is, is coming to a close. Lord, thank you so much that you help us to see that we don't have to be all disillusioned and depressed and things, but we can live right now in this time with joy. Help us, Lord, to know you better. Help us to live like Jesus Christ lives. Help us to live for the eternal things and continue to do good even though we're persecuted because we know that you'll be glorified. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>
everyone i hope that um you that the word of god has touched you and the holy spirit has spoke to you in some way go out and put on a smile show people the joy of our hope our hope in jesus christ all right take care and we'll see you again